I'd like to welcome you to the second session in our series on the Crusades. Last week, I discussed the general circumstances in the Near East that led to the preaching of the First Crusade. I began with the division of the Roman Empire in 395, the rapid collapse of the Western Empire and the continued survival of the Eastern Empire into the 7th century when the emergence of Islam into the Near East caused the empire to lose Egypt and Syria and eventually North Africa. I then spoke about the new balance of power, the new balance of military power and the new diplomatic system that emerged fairly rapidly in the Near East after the first conquests of Islam, in which the territory of the Near East was divided between the Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire. This is a system in which the Empire and the Caliphate were frequently at war, and on two occasions when it did look as if there would be a knockout blow against the Eastern Empire, against the Byzantine Empire, I'll call it, but in which, broadly speaking, the two main powers of the region coexisted and accepted each other's right to exist and the right of each other to its territory. This system continued between about 750 and about 1050, so a 300-year reasonably stable balance of power in the Near East, in which the two empires were more often at peace than at war, and in which the wars mostly partook of low-level raiding. Occasionally an island would be lost, occasionally a large territory would be temporarily lost, but on the whole the two main powers of the Near East, the Byzantine Empire and the Caliphate, were broadly at peace. This system broke down very quickly after about 1050, and it is that collapse that led to the preaching of the First Crusade. And what I want to do this week is to talk about the main events of the First Crusade, I can talk only about the main events, and I cannot talk at length about those main events because it is a gigantic subject. But let me begin with this image on the cover slide. It is the taking of Jerusalem in 1099 by the Crusaders. It's a 19th century painting, I believe in Versailles, by Emile Signol. And this is the key moment. The Crusaders have broken into Jerusalem, and after much hard fighting, and I should say that the phrase hard fighting covers all manner of beastly massacres, but after much hard fighting, the Crusaders have taken the city. The fighting is largely at an end, though in the background you can see continued military operations but in the foreground, you have a crusader knight raising his arms in a gesture of religious exaltation. But notice that the crusader knight in his right hand is holding a sword, which he's holding up in a gesture of religious exaltation. And there is a priest standing also in the foreground, his right hand being kissed. But all around him, you see the bodies of those who have died in the fighting or who are dying in the fighting. And again, in the background, you see continued fighting. The taking of Jerusalem was attended by a vast massacre, a massacre which was unprecedented during the previous 300 years in the Near East. It was a massacre which was notable even in terms of wars in Western Europe. Ever since, and even at the time, the taking of Jerusalem and the Crusades in general have been seen as 
a rather scandalous dereliction from the main commandments of Christianity. How is it that an army sent out in the name of the Prince of Peace could commit such beastly massacres? How indeed could a religion of the Prince of Peace even begin by sending out an army to conquer Jerusalem? And so I should begin with a discussion of the general theology of religious violence. Let us then come to the first of our slides. There we are. It is a general consensus in the West that Islam is a religion of violence. This is not entirely true. Whatever a holy book says, the real views of religion are determined by the majority of those who believe it. And I once had lunch with a Muslim friend who explained, indeed he did a very good job of explaining away all of these verses from the Quran which I've put in blue boxes. He said that these are occasional commandments by the Prophet. They were made in the context of the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century. They do apply in full to the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century but are not necessarily binding on the faithful now. Those people who pick up a copy of the Quran, read through it and start quoting verses and saying, this is what Muslims believe, or this is what a true Muslim ought to believe, are not really paying the kind of attention to Islam that it deserves. It may be that these verses are taken as binding now and for all time, or it may be indeed that they are occasional commands and that since we're no longer living in the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century, they have been as much retired from Islam as all those injunctions in the Old Testament not to wear mixed cotton and polyester underclothes, which... <laughs> but I won't read through these, you can read them by yourselves. There are passages in the Quran which not only justify but enjoin violence for religious ends. To what extent those are taken as binding for all time is not something on which I can speak with any expertise because I am not a Muslim. I do not live within the religion and so I'm in no position to tell you what these mean but you can judge for yourself what some people have taken them to mean and what some people still take them to mean. I think what we can take from this slide is that violence is not alien to the Islamic faith. Let's move to a subject of which I know a great deal more and on which I think we are all rather more competent to comment. Christianity is supposedly a religion of love and peace. You pick up a copy of the New Testament, perhaps leave aside the Old Testament for the moment, but you take up a copy of the New Testament and you are drawn almost immediately to the Sermon on the Mount. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also, and if any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. That is what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount. And later on, when the Sanhedrin sends people into the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Christ, and St. Peter strikes out with a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the guards, Christ heals the man, puts his ear back on, and says, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. If you read these texts while looking at that painting by Emile Signor, you may perhaps scratch your head asking how the Christian faith could have developed to the point where 
Jerusalem could be captured in the way that it was. However, there is a long theological development between the New Testament and the emergence of Christianity as the established faith of the Roman Empire and of the West European barbarian successor states. The truth is that if Christianity is to be an established faith, or indeed if Christianity is to be the faith of a majority population in any territory, total pacifism is a very difficult position to maintain. If you are under no circumstances to use violence, what is a Christian judge supposed to do with a violent murderer? What is a Christian ruler supposed to do if there is an invasion of his territory? Is he supposed simply to say, welcome, my brothers, I know that you are going to rape and steal and burn and kill, but the injunctions of my faith require me to welcome you. Is that what a Christian ruler, is that what a Christian government is supposed to do? And as soon as Christians found themselves in the established faith of a great empire, which had been conquered by the sword, and which had to be defended from outsiders by the sword, there was an almost immediate reconsideration of these verses. And one of the most important men in these reconsiderations was St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo Regius. This is St. Augustine. They who have waged war in obedience to the divine command or in conformity with his laws have represented in their persons the public justice or the wisdom of government, and in this capacity have put to death wicked men, such persons have by no means violated the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. And St. Augustine began the formulation of what is nowadays called just war theory. A war can be regarded as just. A war can be regarded as in conformity to the words of the New Testament if it is a matter of last resort, if there is no alternative to fighting, if the war is declared and conducted by the legitimate authority of a country, if the cause is just, there needs to be some probability of success declaring a war even with just cause and legitimate authority, and even if it is a matter of last resort, but declaring a war with no probability of success is not a just war. There must be a rightful intention. There must be proportionality. If the French were to violate British shipping waters, it would not be appropriate to respond with a nuclear strike, would it? And of course, there must be limited civilian casualties, and there has been a lot of discussion in the past 400 years of this point. If you are defending a city under siege, or if you are besieging a city, you will be directing your main efforts at the military forces in or outside that city, but there will be some collateral damage to civilians. So long as civilians are not targeted, so long as reasonable measures are taken to prevent civilian casualties, then the war can still be just. And so you begin with an injunction made by Christ of total pacifism. You then reinterpret this to mean that violence can be used if the cause is just. And from there you can proceed to the First Crusade. It takes several other steps. But with St. Augustine, the first and probably necessary steps have been taken. Oh, and there is a fairly early representation of St. Augustine. This was created about 200 years after his death. We have no reason to suppose that he looked exactly like that, but that is as close a representation as we can get. Those are probably the clothes that he wore. 
Let us go back to the speech of Urban II, made at Clermont in 1095, when he preached the First Crusade. All who die by the way, whether by land or by sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This is, within Catholicism at least, an undoubted prerogative of the popes. The Pope is the direct successor of St. Peter as Bishop of Rome. St. Peter was told by Christ in Matthew, I think, chapter 16, Thou art Peter, and on this rock shall I build my church, etc. And so the Pope does have the authority to forgive sins, something which became controversial, shall we say, in the 16th century. The Pope has the authority to declare a crusade. The Pope has the authority to forgive people their sins. And the Pope is saying that it is time to roll back the Islamic conquests and to resume Christian control over the holy places in the Near East. The Pope has preached the First Crusade, this was not what the Byzantine Empire had in mind when he sent his letter to the Pope asking for the Pope to oversee the employment of an adequate band of mercenaries who would fight under the Emperor's direction for the recovery of the lost Asian provinces of the Empire. This is not at all what the imperial authorities in Constantinople had had in mind. But this is how the Pope chose to interpret that request for assistance. And as soon as the Pope had made his speech, it was as if a great electric shock had been given to all the peoples of Western Europe. The official crusade, what we call the First Crusade, is a matter of the ruling classes of Western Europe. But it is not only the knights and the kings, it is not only the higher classes of the West who were inspired by the Pope's speech. It was a general inspiration. We begin then with the People's Crusade. The top right slide on the screen, Peter the Hermit preaching the First Crusade. Almost immediately, preachers of various status set out through Western Europe, telling ordinary people of what the Pope had commanded. One of the most famous of these preachers was Peter the Hermit, a monk and charismatic preacher who has a notable role to play, not only in what is called here the People's Crusade, but also in the official First Crusade. In the first instance, however, Peter set out through Western Europe in 1096 and he raised a very large band of largely non-military volunteers. He had no official approval for this, but he raised perhaps 100,000 people, mostly agricultural workers, though many common soldiers who'd fought in previous wars, but also including women and children, a vast band of 100,000 people, and even now, leading and directing 100,000 people is a difficult job. But in those days, it was an extraordinarily difficult job, especially if you want to take those people from Western Europe through Central and Eastern Europe into the Near East. But on the 20th of April, 1096, having gathered this possible army or this possible assembly of 100,000 people, Peter set out from Cologne and he marched all the way through Europe, massacres of Jews along the way and much plundering for food. And of course, there were many losses. People were killed when the locals resisted. Quite often, people would get a certain distance, realise that they were 300 miles from home, and they'd never been more than three miles from home before. They became disheartened, and they set out back. But on the 1st of August, 1096, 
Peter arrived under the walls of Constantinople with possibly 30,000 people. The Emperor Alexius took one look at these people, didn't let them to the gates of the city. Instead, he pointed them across the water at Asia and said, go that way. They were ferried across into Asia. They continued their march through Asia, again with much looting and occasional massacres, until on the 21st of October, 1096, 18 months after setting out from Cologne, this gathering of people was attacked by a regular Turkish army outside Nicaea. Most of them were slaughtered at once. The survivors were enslaved. And that was the end of the People's Crusade. There is a 15th century representation of the People's Crusade in the bottom right of the slide. I should imagine it was a somewhat bloodier encounter than shown in that image. But that was the end of the People's Crusade. Peter himself was not present at the battle or the massacre at Nicaea. He was instead in Constantinople negotiating with the imperial authorities because he was not present at the massacre outside Nicaea, but was in Constantinople. He was able to attach himself to the mainstream crusade when it finally turned up. Let me come back to the official crusade. In August 1096, Many months after the Pope's speech and after much organising, four semi-regular armies set out from Western Europe. These armies were under the nominal leadership of these men, and these bulleted men are worth noting because they do come up again and again in our story. You have Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, he was the oldest and richest and the most experienced of the knights. He was, for many purposes, the titular head at the very least of the Crusader armies. You then have Admar of Le Puy. He was a bishop and he had been appointed the papal legate. He was the official representative of the Pope in the First Crusade. Here's a man to whom I'll pay some attention rather later. You then have other leading crusaders. Bohemond of Taranto, a Norman adventurer from southern Italy, a man with a somewhat mixed reputation. He had been giving the imperial authorities much trouble when he, at the head of a Norman army, invaded the Balkans. He attached himself to the Crusades and continued to cause a great deal of trouble. Indeed, he helped to bring about a general souring of relations between the Byzantine Empire and the Crusaders, and later on between the Empire and the Crusader states. Tancred, the nephew of Bohemond, and look at the titles they took on eventually, Bohemond, Prince of Antioch, Tancred, Prince of Galilee, Regent of the Kingdom of Antioch. You then have Godfrey of Bouillon. He was French, as you can tell from his name, and he was the first ruler of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Not the first king of Jerusalem, because he refused the title, saying that Jerusalem had no king but Christ. But he was the first ruler of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. You then have a great cast of others, Baldwin of Boulogne, a most important man in several instances, Hugh I, Count of Vermandois, brother of the excommunicated Philip I of France, Robert Curthose, brother of William II of England, and his relative Stephen II, Count of Blois, and Robert II, Count of Flanders, and along with these men, you can add much of the scene nobility of Italy, France, Germany and England. This great electric current that ran through Western Europe after the Pope's speech caused men everywhere to put their affairs in order, to sell off lands, to settle legal cases, to gather together their feudal retainers, 
and to gather together in one of those four great semi-regular armies and to set off on what can be called the adventure of a lifetime. They would set out with the full approval of the Pope and therefore of Holy Mother Church and they would see the world and they would kill many people and they might gain great glory and they might well gain great financial and territorial advantage from this. Here is a map which shows the routes taken by the four Crusader armies. You can see that some of them travelled directly overland through central and eastern Europe, crossing into the empire at Belgrade or near to Belgrade, travelling to Constantinople and then taking the route through Asia. Some travelled through Italy down to Tarento and from there they crossed into the empire across the Adriatic but they all turned up under the walls of Constantinople. And the sight of this vast army, the sight of this vast and unexpected army, produced much consternation in Constantinople. And here we come to the first great woman historian, Anna Komnena. She was the daughter of the Emperor Alexius, and she was an eyewitness. She was writing for the most part from personal experience or she went about gathering eyewitness testimony from people whom she knew. She put all of her discoveries together into the Alexiad, one of the great histories of the Middle Ages. It's written in good Attic Greek. It's a very good imitation of Thucydides in both style and content. She does her best to get at the truth. She says in her introduction, My material has been gathered from insignificant writings, absolutely devoid of literary pretensions, and from old soldiers who were serving in the army at the time that my father seized the Roman scepter. I based the truth of my history on them by examining their narratives and comparing them with what I had written and what they told me with what I had often heard from my father in particular and from my uncles, from all these materials, the whole fabric of my history, my true history, has been woven. And what she says about the arrival of the Crusaders is this, for the whole of the West and all the barbarian tribes which dwell between the further side of the Adriatic and the pillars of Heracles, had all migrated in a body and were marching into Asia through the intervening Europe and were making the journey with all their household and they were also so zealous and eager that every high road was full of them and those Frankish soldiers were accompanied by an unarmed host more numerous than the sand or the stars carrying palms and crosses on their shoulders. Women and children too came away from their countries and the sight of them was like many rivers streaming from all sides, and they were advancing towards us through Dacia, generally with all their hosts. Notice that Anna, like other Byzantine intellectuals, have lost track of developments in Western Europe. You cannot call the peoples living in Western Europe at this time barbarian tribes. These are now large, semi-modern nation-states. They're the nations of England, of France, of Germany. They have settled governments. They have dynamic and rapidly progressing economies, which would soon entirely eclipse the economy of the empire itself and the economies of the Islamic kingdoms. But Anna is insistent that these people are barbarians. Apart from that bias, however, her history can be taken as largely accurate. There is the empire as it was at the death of Basil II. By 1096, 1099, the empire was much reduced because it had lost most of its Asian provinces. 
but there is an approximate map of the Byzantine Empire. It's certainly a map of what Alexius had in mind when he talked about reconquering his Asian provinces. Alexius had no ambitions very far south of Laodicea, and Antioch was one of the southern outposts of his empire. Taking Jerusalem was not remotely on his agenda, but even so, that is what the Crusaders assembling under the walls of Constantinople had as their overall objective. There are some representations of Constantinople, the largest and wealthiest city in Europe, with an excellent commercial and strategic location, it stands on the extreme edge of Europe and can look across to Asia. And if you've been to Istanbul, where I was a few months ago, you can stand on the shores of the city. You can stand with the sea walls behind you and you can look across to the Asian shore, which nowadays is part of Greater Istanbul. You can look across the straits and the Asian shore is much, much closer than the coast of France is. If you go to the beach in Deal where I live, or even if you stand on the cliffs above St. Margaret's, where my daughter had her primary school, oh, there are the walls of Constantinople. When the Crusaders turned up under those, the Byzantine authorities, indeed everyone inside the city, was very glad that the walls were in good repair. Indeed, if those walls had been kept in better repair, things might have gone rather better in 1204, but that's another story, a story to which we'll come. The Crusaders arrived under the walls of Constantinople in late 1096. How many Crusaders were there? Some people think that it was as many as 100,000, but modern estimates, David Nicoll, for example, says that the armies probably consisted of 30 to 35,000 footmen with about 5,000 cavalry, and that is entirely probable. The Crusaders, they arrived under the walls of Constantinople, and I emphasise they arrived under the walls because they found the gates shut. But they arrived under the walls with little food, and they expected full assistance from Alexius. They would not necessarily serve under him, but they were proposing to do him a considerable favour, by their lights at least. And so they expected that the emperor would be open-handed with food and money. Alexius took one look at these armies assembling under the walls of his capital. He had no interest in leading them. He was mainly concerned with getting them across the water to Asia as quickly as possible and waving goodbye to them in the same way as he had waved goodbye to the People's Crusades somewhat earlier. However, Although the gates of the city were shut against the main crusader armies, Alexius did invite the leaders in for conference with him. The deal he struck with them was that he would supply adequate food and supplies for their journey through Asia, in return for which the crusader leaders would swear fealty to him in the western sense, and they would promise to return to the empire such lands as they recovered from the Turks as had within living memory been part of the empire. There was no question that Jerusalem or anywhere else would be returned to the empire. Alexius had no interest at all in wide-scale conquest. All he wanted to do was to restore the borders of the empire as it had been about 25 years ago at the time of the Battle of Manzikert when the Turks had taken most of the Asian provinces. Most of the crusader leaders were content with that deal. They themselves had no interest in the empire's Asian provinces. These were simply territories through which they wanted to travel towards their objective, which was Jerusalem. They took the oath of fealty because it was entirely convenient for them. They got food, they got supplies, 
They promised to return to the emperor territories in which they had no interest. The emperor, by implication, had no interest in the territories that they wanted to seize. Raymond of Toulouse avoided swearing the oath, though, in effect, he made the same promise as the other leaders. He said that he would cause no harm to the empire, which was good enough for Alexius. In June 1097, Alexius had the entire body of the Crusaders ferried across the Straits from Europe into Asia. He then stood watching as they marched into the distance and below the horizon, whereupon he went back through the gates of the city and doubt his thought, oh, thank heavens for that, it didn't go as badly as it might have. What happened next? The leaders of the First Crusade were men of considerable military experience. They knew what they wanted. The first objective was to take Nicaea, which you can see on the map given on the slide on the right. Mm -hmm. Nicaea mm -hmm. is the capital of the Turkish territories in what had been the Asian provinces of the empire. It was a strongly defended city and it was of great strategic importance because if the enemy had been allowed to remain in control of Nicaea, it would have been able to control all communications between the Crusader armies south of Nicaea and Constantinople. So the first objective was to take Nicaea about 120 miles south of Constantinople. The Crusaders marched inland, heading across the Anatolian plain. Although the Crusaders were men of considerable military experience, they were not used to the much hotter and drier climate of what is now central Turkey, and they suffered much in the heat. On the 1st of July 1097, they were taken by surprise by a large Turkish army. The Crusaders were taken entirely by surprise and they were almost defeated. However, at the last moment, there was the arrival of reinforcements led by Raymond of Toulouse and Godfrey of Bouillon. They saved the day. And this was the first battle in which Bishop Admar took place. He was a bishop. He was a consecrated bishop of the church and he was the papal legate. Here somewhere I have a representation of him. There we are. There is Admar on the left hand side of that illustration. He is wearing chainmail and a bishop's mitre and in his hand he is holding a spear. It is the Holy Lance. It is the alleged spear with which a Roman soldier pierced the side of Christ at the crucifixion. But it may be taken as rather a scandalous representation by the lights of modern mainstream Christianity. A consecrated bishop is not supposed to lead his men into battle, even if he is carrying a relic of the greatest sanctity. But Admar led his men into battle at Dorylion, and partly as a result of that, there was a complete victory against this much larger Turkish army. And Anna records, This so terrified the Turks that it made them turn their backs. Remembering the emperor's advice, the Latins did not pursue them far, but reached the Turks' lines, and after resting very little, overtook them again near Augustopolis and attacked and routed them utterly. After that, the barbarian power collapsed. The survivors dispersed, one here, one there, leaving their wives and children behind them. As for the future, they did not dare to meet the Latins face to face, but tried to find safety for themselves in flight. The Battle of Dorylaeum was a complete victory for the Crusaders. It broke Turkish power throughout the Asian provinces of the empire. 
It was not simply that the Crusaders took Nicaea. It was not simply that they defeated a large Turkish army. It is that they brought about a total collapse of Turkish power within the Asian territories of the empire, and following behind the Crusader armies, Alexius was able to come up and re-secure those provinces. And so thus far, the interests of the empire and the interests of the Crusaders are entirely in accord. It is turning out to be a great success. Alexius hadn't wanted large independent armies with different objectives from his own, but as it turns out, it isn't too bad. The Crusaders are good fighters. They've defeated the Turks in a single battle. They have destroyed Turkish power in a single battle. And something like the empire as left by Basil II in 1025, is rapidly re-established. The empire never takes the less valuable territories in the centre of what had been the Asian provinces, but it rapidly takes all the coastal cities and all of the most valuable and the most densely populated agricultural land. Everything is going well so far. The Crusaders are victorious, and it is, though not as part of its main agenda, but it is doing the job that Alexius had thought of when he first wrote to the Pope. There are some representations of this battle. It was a great battle. On the left, you have an illustration by Gustave Doré. On the right, you have a somewhat closer representation made, I think, in the 15th century. The Crusaders move on. They pass to the southern extremities of what had been the Asian provinces of the empire, and they came to the great fortified city of Antioch. This is about halfway between Constantinople and Jerusalem. And let me go back to the map. You can't do history without maps, so let's have a look at the map. There we are. Can you see Antioch? It's just to the right of Cyprus. So the Crusaders move very rapidly through the territory of modern Turkey. You could call this a medieval blitzkrieg. They meet almost no resistance after having defeated the Turks. They arrive almost unopposed under the walls of Antioch. This had been heavily fortified by the Byzantine emperors. This had been the southern outpost of the empire. It had been taken by the Turks in the 1080s, I believe. It was now being held a heavily fortified city, a city protected by state-of-the-art fortifications. These had been built by the empire for its defence. They were now held by the Turks for their defence. The Crusaders did not have the numbers or the technical means to break through the walls of Antioch. And you see, the Crusaders must take Antioch just as it had been necessary for them to take Nicaea, because it is a critical link in the chain of communications between the front of the Crusader armies and their base in Constantinople. Stephen of Blois took one look at Antioch and described it as a city great beyond belief, very strong and unassailable. It was a city so large and so strongly defended that the Crusaders did not have the numbers needed for a total blockade of the city, and the city therefore was able to remain partially supplied. Now, when you are laying siege to a city, one of the tactics is to starve the city into surrender. However, this was not a very fortunate siege. By the January of 1098, thousands of crusaders, thousands of the besiegers were themselves dying of starvation. 
the people of Antioch were adequately supplied from the outside, the crusader besiegers themselves were running increasingly short of food. Admar, the papal legate, believed that this was a punishment from God for the sins of the crusaders, not necessarily the large numbers of people they'd killed, but the fact that the crusader camp was filled by women of somewhat low reputation. So Admar caused all the women to be expelled from the camp. He also declared a fast and a round of prayers, almsgiving, and various religious processions. This was not entirely sufficient because many of the crusaders, Stephen of Blois included, lost heart. They decided that Antioch was untakeable, and so Stephen set out back along the road to Constantinople. Unfortunately, and this is a matter of great consequence, Unfortunately, Stephen met Alexius, who was hurrying down with a decent army to give assistance to the Crusaders. What Stephen said to Alexius was, it's all up. Antioch is a disaster. The whole thing is over. Now, because Alexius was told that on good authority by what he took to be one of the leaders of the Crusade, at this point, he said to himself, oh, that's sad, we're not getting Antioch back. But never mind, I've got my Asian provinces for the most part. That will do. And so Alexia stopped and didn't continue to Antioch to supply the Crusader armies or to add to their weight. He left them to sort things out by themselves. Now, the Crusaders did manage to get some supplies through because Western fleets were now operating in the eastern Mediterranean. The cities of Cilicia and Edessa and the recently captured ports of Latakia and Port St. Simeon were open. Through those, some supplies were able to reach Antioch and we can take pride, or at least we can note that this was largely the achievement of an English fleet, an English naval operation in the eastern Mediterranean. There we are. However, although they are in a weak position, they do not have the numbers or the military technology to break through the fortifications of Antioch. The Crusaders still have the considerable benefit of surprise the Islamic powers are not at all united. They have not understood the nature of this new force in the Near East. They believe that the Crusaders are simply an army of Byzantine mercenaries who so far have been lucky. Therefore, the other Islamic powers do not come together to send an adequate relief force to Antioch. In June 1098, somebody inside Antioch, and remember that probably most of the inhabitants of Antioch are Christians, at least very large minorities of the people in the projected territories are Christians. And so in June 1098, a traitor inside Antioch, or let's not call him a traitor, somebody inside Antioch opens the gate. The crusaders pour in and slaughter most of the Muslim inhabitants. They also slaughter the Greek Christians, the Syrians and Armenians, because you see, although Christians and Muslims have a different faith, they dress alike, they have the same beards, they do the same things. To an outsider, they're indistinguishable. They're all Orientals with turbans and funny clothes and beards and so on. And so there is a general massacre. But the Crusaders have now got in through the gates and they've taken Antioch. But the troubles don't end there. On the 4th of June, just two days after the Crusaders have taken Antioch, an army of 40,000 Turks turns up. It's too late to defeat the Crusaders in open battle. 
but the Crusaders are now under siege themselves. They are no longer besieging Antioch, instead they are besieged at Antioch. Because there's limited food at Antioch, they are just as hungry inside the walls as they had been outside. And here we have one of the Arab chronicles of the Crusades, the chronicle of a man, and forgive my Arabic pronunciation, the chronicle of a man called Ibn al-Athir. He says, After taking Antioch, the Franks camped there for twelve days without food. The wealthy ate their horses, and the poor ate carrion and leaves from the trees. Their leaders, faced with this situation, wrote to Kerabaga, the Turkish leader, to ask for safe conduct through his territory, but he refused, saying, you will have to fight your way out. A most unwise reply in the circumstances. Bohemond, the Norman soldier of fortune, and Bishop Admar have to bar the city gates to prevent mass desertions, and they manage to hold things together. Then you have the discovery of the Holy Lance. And if you remember last week, I showed you that medieval image of the finding of the Holy Lance in St. Peter's Cathedral in Antioch. A young man called Peter Bartholomew claims that he's been visited by St. Andrew in a dream and shown the location of the Holy Lance that had pierced the side of Christ at the crucifixion. He tells the crusader leaders that this lance is buried under the floor of St. Peter's Cathedral. The leaders order an immediate search for this holy lance. The floor of the church is dug up, and at first nothing is found. At last, when everyone is about to give up, Peter Bartholomew himself jumps into one of the great holes dug in the floor, digs around in the dirt, and at last holds up a metal object, saying, here it is, this is the tip of the Holy Lance. Now you can take from that what you will. But here on the right is what may be the Holy Lance. It's now in Armenia. It comes with some provenance, though there are other alleged Holy Lances around. This may be the object that Peter Bartholomew held up in St. Peter's Church in Antioch. Whatever you choose to believe about this, it was taken as a miracle, as a sign from God, and immensely inspired by the finding of this holy lance, the crusaders decided that they would march out of the gates at once and engage the Turks in a pitched battle. And that is what they did on the 28th of June, 1098. The gates of Antioch opened, the crusaders streamed out in military formation, and they inflicted a total defeat on this much larger Turkish army. And there again is a representation of Bishop Admar leading his men into battle under the walls of Antioch. He is holding the Holy Lance in his hand. And again, you can see the bishop's mitre on top of his chainmail. The Crusaders have won at Antioch. They've taken Nicaea. They've taken Antioch, the chain of communications between the front of the Crusader armies and Constantinople is secure. But here is the difficulty. Alexius had promised in Constantinople that he would give all necessary support to the Crusader armies in return for which they would hand over to him such territories as had within living memory been part of his empire. It does look as though Alexius has broken that deal. He turned back. Alexius could claim, I was given what seemed to be authoritative information that you had lost. Therefore, I saw no purpose in continuing my march towards you. As far as the Crusaders were concerned, Alexius had tried to stab them in the back. So the Crusaders have taken Antioch. This had 
until recently been the southernmost defence of the empire. The Crusaders refused to hand the city back to Alexius, the city and the territories around it. Indeed, Bohemond, that Norman soldier of fortune, declares himself Prince of Antioch. He then stays in the city to secure his command of the city and its surrounding territories and lets the other crusaders press on towards Jerusalem. And this, as I keep on saying, is a matter of immense consequence. Anna Komnena records the correspondence between Bohemond and Alexius. Soon the emperor sent a letter to Bohemond which ran as follows. You know the oaths and promises which not only you but all the counts took to the Roman Empire. Now you were the first to break them by retaining possession of Antioch and then taking more fortresses and even Laodicea itself. Therefore withdraw from Antioch and all the other cities and do what is just and right and do not provoke more wars and troubles for yourself. Now Bohemond, after reading the emperor's letter, could not reply by a falsehood as he usually did, for the facts openly declared the truth. So outwardly he assented to it, but put the blame for all the wrong he had done upon the emperor, and wrote to him thus, It is not I but you who are the cause of all this, for you promised you would follow us with a large army, but you never thought of making good your promise by deeds. In what way would it be just for us to deprive ourselves willingly of what we gained by our own sweat and toil? When the envoys returned from him, the emperor recognised from the reading of his letter that he was still the same Bohemond, and in no wise changed for the better, and therefore decided that he must protect the boundaries of the Roman Empire, and as far as possible check his impetuous advance. What that means is that Alexius opened lines of communication with the other Islamic rulers in the Near East. He ceased to regard the Crusaders as automatically his allies. Instead, he set about trying to re-establish some kind of balance of power which would be to his benefit. This is the beginning of subsequent difficulties between the Empire and the Crusader kingdoms. However, in June 1099, the Crusader armies arrived under the walls of Jerusalem, which again was a very strongly defended city. But now the Crusaders have a great deal of understanding of siege tactics in the Near East. In July 1099, Godfrey of Wion manages to get siege towers close enough to the walls of Jerusalem for men to jump across onto the walls and to fight off the resistance they meet. And here we have the account of Raymond Daguier. Later, all of our people went to the sepulchre of our Lord, rejoicing and weeping for joy, and they rendered up the offering that they owed. In the morning, some of our men cautiously ascended to the roof of the temple and attacked the Saracens, both men and women, beheading them with naked swords. The remainder sought death by jumping down from the temple. When Tancred heard of this, that's Bohemond's nephew, when Tancred heard of this, he was filled with anger. And here we come to a passage from the Gesta Francorum, which together with the history of Anna, is our main contemporary source for the First Crusade. This is an account of the fighting after the Crusaders have got inside the walls of Jerusalem. The emir, who commanded the Tower of St. David, surrendered to the Count and opened that gate at which the pilgrims had always been accustomed to pay tribute. But this time the pilgrims entered the city, pursuing and killing the Saracens up to the Temple of Solomon, where the enemy gathered in force. The battle raged throughout the day, so that the temple was covered with their blood. When the pagans had been overcome, our men seized great numbers, both men and women, either killing them or keeping them captive as they wished. On the roof of the temple, a great number of pagans of both sexes had assembled, 
and these were taken under the protection of Tancred and Gaston of Beard. Afterward, the army scattered throughout the city and took possession of the gold and silver, the horses and mules, and the houses filled with goods of all kinds. Jerusalem at this time was a large and wealthy city, as well as very well fortified. And in the bottom right of the slide, you can see an approximate map of Jerusalem at the time of the First Crusade. And so the Crusaders have taken Jerusalem. And we come back to the opening image for this session. There is the defining moment, the culminating moment of the siege of Jerusalem. Religious exaltation among a sea of the slaughtered dead. What we can say from this is that the Crusaders turned up under the walls of Constantinople. They made a collective deal with the emperor. They marched south. They defeated the Turks outside Nicaea at Dorylaeum. They took Nicaea. They cleared the Turks out of the Asian provinces. Alexius followed behind, securing those territories for the empire. The Crusaders continued south to Antioch, which, after much trouble, they conquered and then held, defeating another large Turkish army and thereby finishing the destruction of Turkish power for the next century or so. The Crusaders then moved on to Jerusalem, which again they took. They entered Jerusalem... They carried out a great massacre of the population of Jerusalem. Much booty, but much slaughter. And they have achieved every objective which was given to them by the Pope. And they have done this by their own efforts, with limited support from the Byzantine Emperor. The question is, what to do next? What is the plan? They have taken Jerusalem, and by extension they've taken the holy places. These will not be given to Alexius. Alexius never wanted them in the first place, and there is certainly no question of handing them over to Alexius now. There is no question of going to Alexius and saying, I know you don't want them, but you've got them now. These are restored to Christendom. You are the head of the main Christian power in the region, Therefore, you must from now on be the protector of the holy places. There is no question of that. The Crusaders have taken Jerusalem and the holy places by their own efforts, and they will hold the holy places by their own efforts. No guidance had been given by the Pope in his great speech as to what should be done with the holy places once they were taken back from the Islamic powers. So the Crusaders now have to sit down and decide exactly what they will do. I'll talk about that next week, but for the moment, here on the left you have a representation again from the early 15th century, I think, of the taking of Jerusalem. But on the right, rather more important than that, you have the outcome of the First Crusade. What you have is a collection of crusader states. The largest and most important of these is the Kingdom of Jerusalem. North of this, you have the County of Tripoli. North of this, you have the Principality of Antioch. This is the kingdom carved out by Bohemond once he announced that he would from now on be the Prince of Antioch and he would not hand Antioch and its surrounding territories back to the emperor. And then north of that, you have the Principality of Armenian Cilicia and the County of Edessa, somewhat marginal territories. But together, these are the Crusader kingdoms or the Crusader states. And from the taking of Jerusalem for many years after, it was possible to say that these Crusader states were the greatest military power in the Near East. 
the Byzantine emperor had no choice but to do business with these people, business of various kinds, and the surrounding Islamic powers had no choice but to open diplomatic communications with them. And so this represents a complete and unexpected revolution in the affairs of the Near East. You have a projection of Western power deep into the Eastern Mediterranean, deep into the Near East. These kingdoms together are the greatest military power in the region, and this will be the new shape of things for the next 150 years at the least. Although Alexius opens friendly and very close diplomatic relations with the surrounding Islamic powers, he really has no choice but to deal with these crusader states on some basis of equality. But there are weaknesses in these crusader states. These borders are approximate. They were always shifting. As I suppose with the modern state of Israel, they were in a weak strategic location. There was a lack of natural frontiers, and there was no strategic depth. The Crusaders could win any number of battles against the surrounding Islamic powers, and this would buy time for them, but the Crusaders had only to lose one big battle, and they faced total extinction. This is the central fact of the Crusader kingdoms for the next 150 years. But 150 years, that's a very long time in human terms, and this is the approximate shape of the Levant, or the Near East, or whatever you want to call it. This was the approximate shape of that region for the next 150 years, and it was established by that medieval blitzkrieg setting out from under the walls of Constantinople and culminating in the taking of Jerusalem. So that is the First Crusade. It is by no means everything that I could say about the First Crusade. There are whole libraries written about it. But are there any questions arising? Absolutely fascinating, thank you. Okay, well thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed it.